At the end of the passage last week, we came to the, in the story of First Samuel, to the place where the ark of God was carried to Aphek to give the Israelites victory over the Philistines. But because of the sin of Israel in Israel and in the priesthood, the sons of Eli were killed. Israel fled from the battle and 30,000 soldiers of Israel died in battle and the ark of God was captured. When the news came, comes back to Eli, he also t died when he fell backward from his stool and broke his neck. And his daughter-in-law also died as she gave birth to a son. And as she gave birth, she named him the child Ichabod. In the verses 21 of that chapter 4, it says, She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark god has been captured, and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. I decided to take our sermon this morning, our title, from this verse where she says the, the glory of God has departed from Israel. If we do a little study of the, the passage, we'll learn that the name she gave this son who was born, Ichabod, it means no glory. And it comes out, the, the idea of the glory of God comes out of the passage in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35. When she speaks of glory departing from Israel, it reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant being the place of the presence of God in the tabernacle. When Israel was still in the wilderness, Yahweh was often uh, appeared to Israel in the pillar of cloud. And whenever he wanted to make known his presence, the cloud would descend to the entrance of the tent of meeting and the Shekinah glory, the blinding white light of the presence of God would appear in the cloud. That this same um, sign of his presence of God would uh, appear uh, when the Lord met with Moses on Mount Sinai. When he climbed up the mountain, the brilliance of the God's Shekinah glory was seen in the cloud which covered the top of the mountain. And again, when the tabernacle was completed with all the furnishings were, were put in place and they dedicated the tabernacle, the cloud descended upon the tabernacle and his glory filled the tabernacle. In verse in cha Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, it, uh, it says that the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The ark was to be kept in the most holy place of the tabernacle. It was the place where the Lord appeared in the cloud above the mercy seat between the two cherubim. This symbol of God's presence was now captured by the Philistines. So she says, the glory of God has departed from Israel. Apparently, soon after the defeat of Israel in the battle of Ebenezer and Aphek, the Philistines traveled to the hill country to the worship center at Shiloh and burned the worship center where the tabernacle was was set up. Archaeological digs have been have also been done there and they've confirmed the destruction and burning of that worship site about this time in the history of Israel. When we search the scriptures and to find out any more information we can about the destruction of Shiloh, Jeremiah chapter 7 12 says this about it. He says, go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. 
while you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called to you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what did I what I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, and the place I gave to you and your fathers. I will thrust you from my presence, just as I did all your brothers, the people of Ephraim. The Philistines believe they have just had a great victory over the Israelites. They had won a great battle. They destroyed the worship center at Shiloh. They captured the Ark of God. And in their minds, this was the God of the enemies. In their minds, this was the God of their enemy, Israel. And with the help of their gods, they had defeated him. A common custom when an enemy was defeated in battle was to carry away from the battlefield any idols that the enemy would have carried with them into the fight to give them victory. These captured idols would then be carried off and displayed in the temple of their own gods as symbols of the superiority of their God who had defeated them. But what the Philistines did not know was that the God of Israel does not dwell in an idol. He, his, the creator of heaven and earth does not, dwell, does not dwell in temples made by man, but his spirit fills the heaven and earth and he rules over all creation. He is able to use all creation to fight his battles. And the most shocking and surprising thing, he even uses the armies of the enemies of Israel to carry out his bidding to execute judgments on the earth. According to Jeremiah, it was not the Philistines who destroyed Shiloh. It was Yahweh who destroyed it. As Jeremiah says, it was Yahweh who said, see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. Yahweh had used the Philistines as his instrument of judgment to punish Israel for their sins. Now he's about to reveal himself to the Philistines. He has not been captured, nor have the gods of the Philistines given them power to defeat him. They are now to have an encounter with him in the midst. Who is it come into their midst by the presence of the ark? They are, they will in the end learn that he and he alone is God who rules. They are, they also will learn that they must bow down before him. If we go to chapter 5, verse 1, where in our reading for today, that when the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it to, from Ebenezer to Ashdod, one of the five major cities of the Philistines. And then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside their idol Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen down face downward and on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early in the morning, behold, Dagon had fallen down face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both of his hands were laying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon's and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The Philistines, they believed that Dagon was the head of their pantheon of gods. By causing him to fall down before the ark of Yahweh, Yahweh is revealing to the Philistines that it is Yahweh who is the God of gods and Lord of lords. He rules heaven and earth by breaking off his Dagon's hand, head and hands. Yahweh is also revealing that Dagon has no power before him. He cannot do or say anything. He is but a dumb idol of stone. This is not unlike the earlier story of Samson when the 
Philistines cut his hair and he was taken prisoner. If we were to take a short look just in Judges chapter 16, 23 to 30, it tells about the death of Samson. After they captured Samson and poked out his eyes, and beginning in our passage in verse 23, it, sa it says, Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our god has given Samson in our enemy into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has given it, our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson, that we may he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars, and Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Lord God, please remember me. Please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the enemies, be, be, on the Philistines for my two eyes. And, and Samson grasped the middle two pillars upon which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the left one and, and, left, and, and his left hand on the other, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed were at his death were more than those who he killed during his life. In both of these stories, God executes judgment over his enemies. What the Philistines failed to understand is that they were not victorious because of their gods. They were victorious because God, Yahweh was punishing those who had sinned and was using them to execute his judgment. Samson sinned by allowing Delilah to know that his great strength came from his dedication of his life to God. He was a Nazarite and not cutting his hair and not drinking wine were signs of his dedication to Yahweh. He had broken the covenant by a dedication as a Nazarite to Yahweh by telling the Delilah his secret of not cutting his hair and the Philistines came and cut it off, thus breaking the connection between Samson and his God, his sign of dedication. In the case of the capture of the ark, it was the ark which contained the tablets of the covenant. Israel had broken the covenant by taking the idols of the nations and bowing down before them. They, were, they also were being punished by God for their sins. In verse 6, the story continues in First Samuel chap chapter 5, verse 6. The hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people against the people of Israel, a, a people of Ashdod, and he terrified of, and, and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. At this point in the story, it seems to begin to teach that the Philistines, to Yahweh seems to begin to teach the Philistines about himself. He teaches that he is holy and he punishes all people who do not worship him and he punishes them for their sins in addition to their de to demonstrating his power over the idol dagon the next series of events point proclaims this point the population of ashdod and its surrounding region become terrified and afflicted with tumors they recognize the terrifying plague that it 
that struck their city as the being the work of the hand of the of God, the hand of the Lord at work. The Greek Old Testament adds, and rats appeared in their land and death and destruction were throughout the city. It is well known that rats carry bubonic plague, the, which causes painful swelling of the lymph nodes and buboes in the armpits and groin and untreated the disease is fatal in well over half of those who contract it. During the Middle Ages, it devastated Europe. To, for us to maybe to dispute that whether the possibility that this is bubonic plague or not is, is to miss the, the, the point. Yahweh is the God who visits the plagues on his enemies. The, <coughs> the Philistines won the battle. But Yahweh won the war. The population is decimated wherever the ark is taken. This is the same God who brought ten terrible plagues on the Egyptians. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of God of Israel must remain, must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against the Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? Initially, they had a temporary solution. They decided to send it somewhere else. They answered, Let the ark of God be brought round to Gath. So they brought the ark of God of Israel there. And after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against that city, causing a very great panic, and he afflicted them, the men of the city, both young and old, so that the tumors broke out on them. So they sent the God, the ark of the God of God to Ekron. And as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the ark the ark of God of Israel to us to kill our people. So in verse 11, they decided to send it back to its own place. Verse 11, they said, they sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there, is a, there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the city, the cry of the city went up to heaven. By this time, many months have passed since the ark of God had come to dwell with the Philistines. Whenever, wherever they move the ark in the northern cities of Philistia, plague breaks out, and the population is terrified and afflicted with boils. And people are dying. We, we do not know how many died, but if it is bubonic plague, the region was overrun with rats and the number of the dead would have been very great. When we read verse 12, the city, the cry of the city went up to heaven. It appears that the Philistines now recognize that this plague is from Yahweh. And in desperate straits, the Philistines prayed to a God greater than their local deities. By means of the plague, they are now beginning to worship Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. Because before they knew of him only from reports of what he had done in Egypt long ago and with Moses and Joshua. Now they have seen firsthand his power in their midst. But further word from God and the teachings of his ways, they cannot understand how, but without those teachings, they cannot understand how to worship him and how to live in a way to please him. So what was their response? 1 Samuel 6 verses 1 to 9. Many people got sick and many people died. 
So they decided this God of Israel is against us and our gods. They decided in chapter 6, verses 1 to 9, the ark of God was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us what we should. Tell us with what we shall send it to its place. And they said, if you send away the ark of God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, what is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? And they answered, five golden tumors, and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the plague was on all of you and on your, uh, on your lords. So you must make images of the tumors and images of your, of the, your mice that ravage the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? After he had dealt severely with them, did they not send the people away and they departed? Now then, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows which there have, has ne on which never has come a yoke and the yoke cows to the, the yoke the cows to the cart, but take the calves home away from them. And take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put it in a box at its side, the figures of gold of which, which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then send it off, let it go its way and watch. If it goes on its way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done, this great, done us this great harm. And if it is not, then we shall know that it was not his hand that struck us, but it happened to us by, by chance, by coincidence. So what can we say for ourselves this morning and conclusions today? The providential circumstances of the plague spreading to, to every city where the Ark of the Covenant was taken, also combined with the little knowledge of God of Israel that they possessed, they concluded and they brought they brought them to to conclude several things in the past the god of israel had afflicted pharaoh and his armies with plagues and death because of the harden he had hardened his heart and refused to listen and did not do what moses had told him this same god was now in their midst and they now suffered a plague possibly because they had defeated Israel and captured the ark, they must make an offering and return it to its place so that his hand would turn away and from afflicting them. They chose an offering that re represented the plague and that they were suffering, five golden tumors and five golden mice. Tumors and the mice were associated with the plague. Five was for the city states and who and the lords who ruled the, the Philistines. When I hear this story and try to put it into our modern day context, I wonder what the people of today would say should a plague like those in the book of Revelations, if it should break out among us, that book speaks about seven, the book of Revelation speaks about seven bowls of God's wrath, a plague of ug ugly, painful sores, a sea being turned to blood like a dead man, every living thing in the sea dying, rivers of and springs of water turning to blood. Then the sun will be given the power to scorch the world with fire. These plagues are brought, were brought on the earth because the people of the earth shed the blood of the Lord's saints and the prophets. 
when the people suffered under these plagues and were in agony, they refused to repent of what they had done. How far? I'd like to just ask us, how far are we from that today? When we have a plague that has now killed 200 million people worldwide and, and there are droughts, fires, famines on every continent. And we say, we have got this. We can conquer it by cutting carbon emission and getting vaccinations, by doing better land management. We do not know the God who rules over heaven and earth and who has the power over nature. We should be leading the way in repentance and prayer of petition to the Lord to heal the land. So my applications from 1 Samuel are relatively simple this morning. I would suggest to us um, we need to recognize the hand of God. We need to worship him as God. And if there is evil we have done, we need to repent. And then turn and intercede for the world around us. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do worship you this morning that we acknowledge that you are the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the God of creation. You reign on high over heaven and earth. There's nothing too hard for you and nothing outside your control underneath the power of your hand. We give worship to you this morning. We acknowledge that there are punishments we do not understand. There are judgments in this world and our worldview keeps our eyes blinded to our the connection of that judgment to our own sins. Help us, Lord, to see the world through your eyes to see through the eyes of your scripture that enlighten us, teach us about you and about your ways. Help us to know you but fully and not to think as the world thinks, but to think as only God, the people of God who know you can think. Let us come into your presence, Lord, with thanksgiving and praise this morning, for we have a God who is holy. We have a God who is righteous and judge of heaven and earth and has appointed a day of judgment. And we also know that you have granted us the mercies of Christ that we might enter into your presence, that we might be forgiven of our sins. In this, we give praise this morning. We praise you in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen.